Let's get to it. Hey, welcome to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in episode four of Andor. So the first three episodes of this series were very much about introducing us to Cassian, exploring his background, and letting us know exactly where he is at this point in his life. In our last video, I talked about how all of this background shading was necessary to show us his journey, and more importantly, how it sheds new light on the Rebel Alliance. The first three episodes almost feel like a prologue to the rest of the series. And now we're getting into the meat of the story, with Cassian getting set up with a heist crew and we start to see the behind-the-scenes politicking that led to the creation of the Rebel Alliance. So we begin with Luthen and Cassian barely escaping security forces with Cassian being injured. Star Wars is always at its best when it's telling an underdog story, and with this opening, I can't help but recall the ending of The Empire Strikes Back, when the Imperials are bearing down on Luke and friends after he was maimed by Vader. And this... <laughs> never gets old. Like, leave a comment if driving through snow still reminds you of hyperspace. So, they're heading to planet Aldani, which was created for the series, and thank God they are not headed to Tatooine. There is too much Tatooine. So, Luthen starts his recruitment pitch, and Cassian lists the various rebel factions. Alliance, Sep, Guerrilla, Partisan Front. One of them. Now, Alliance obviously refers to the Rebel Alliance to Restore the Republic, which would be in its very earliest days at this time. Sect could refer to any number of organized subsets of a guild or a corporate zone that's sympathetic to the Rebellion, and Guerrilla refers to anyone doing hit-and-run attacks against the Empire, such as the Rebel Ghost Cell on Lethal that we see at the beginning of Rebels. And Partisan Front is actually one of the larger groups at this time period. This is referring to the group that is controlled by Saul Guerrero. Saul began to form this sect in the days right after the Empire was formed, as we saw in the Bad Batch. Well, we're here to neutralize a group of insurgents. <laughs> well, here we are. And by the time of Rogue One, their ruthlessness had become legendary and was actually seen as a political hindrance by the Rebel Alliance. His militancy has caused the Alliance a great many problems. We even saw one of Saul's partisan attacks in Rogue One. And once on Geonosis, he almost committed genocide against the race who built the Death Star. Now, Cassian doesn't think much of any of these groups. He hates the Empire, but he thinks any organized effort to stop it is doomed to fail. His defeatism is a mirror to a lot of people who say things like, I don't vote, it's all rigged, and it's all corrupt anyways. Which is a lot like the defeatist real-world version of saying this. Somehow Palpatine returned. Man, I never get tired of hearing that. And you know, we here at Screen Crush always try to show you as many classic movie clips as possible. And one of my favorites relates to Mephisto, and it's one of the greatest all-time movie scenes. Not the beast! Ah! And guess what? Now you can have your very own Not the Beast t-shirt straight from us, and it's available for a limited time only. If you would like to have one of these shirts and support our channel, you can check out our merch store at shopzeroedition.com slash screencrush. All of our shirts have a soft feel, they fit great, and when you buy one of our merch shirts, you're really buying a piece of us. This Not The Beast shirt is exclusive to Screen Crush, and get it fast because once they're gone, it's gone. Just like your favorite HBO Max cartoons. Too soon, buddy. Shopping our store is the best way to support our channel, and we worked hard with the team at Zero Edition to make this awesome shirt for all of you Screen Crush fans. So be on the lookout for more items coming soon, and be sure to tag us on Twitter when you get your merch and let us know what you think. Now back to the Easter eggs. Then we get our first major Easter egg of the show. We learn that Cassian was sent to an Imperial prison, and at age 16, he was forced to the front lines on a planet called Membum. Now, Membum is a world that is very rich in resources, so it was the site of a large battle during the Clone Wars. And after the Clone Wars, the Empire moved quickly to seize all of its resources, resulting in a bloody war called the Membum Campaign. And we've already seen this campaign on screen in the movie Solo. Solo, get up! We're almost there! Almost where? Where are we going? This is the battle that was so bloody that it sent Han into joining up with Beckett and his crew. Cassian even says, Two years of it straight out of prison into the mud. Like the mud that Han was drenched in during his days in the infantry. So it's likely that Cassian was here at the same time as Han, and since he was a cook, he probably served him some chow at the barracks. Luthen says that the Empire had the people hating each other on this planet, maybe referring to the Membin Liberation Army and the rest of the population of the planet. And this is Colonizing 101. A larger military power divides the population against one another and then seizes control. Luthen gives a pretty convincing argument for fighting the Empire. Wouldn't you rather give it all at once to something real? and carve off useless pieces till there's nothing left. And then we learn that this is going to be about an Ocean's Eleven style heist. Now, back at Coruscant, we see the planets are being labeled with the same font that we saw in Rogue One, keeping this show in that same stylistic vein. The first three episodes saw corporate security trying to keep the Empire from being too involved. And now, it's way worse than that. They have gotten the Imperial Security Bureau involved. This is the Imperial Secret Police. They're like the CIA, the FBI, the KGB, and the Tau Shi'ar all rolled into one. We see a meeting being led by Major Partagas, 
as being played by Anton Lester, also known for playing Kyburn on Game of Thrones. But our main POV character here is Dedra, an ambitious ISB officer who's trying to enlarge her influence. Currently, she only controls three sectors while her colleagues have seven. Hey, what's that mean, sectors? Well, in the Star Wars video games at least, a sector consists of 10 systems, as in 10 solar systems or 10 planets. So Dedra is supervising up to 30 planets inside the Empire, which apparently is not enough for her. And later, Kyburn says to her, There's a high bar for your performance, Lieutenant. And that higher bar is because she's a woman. You probably noticed that there were no women Imperial officers in the original trilogy. Now, there are a few of note in the books and in the comics, but they're very few and far between. An officer jockeying for position is pretty common in the Empire. The second Thrawn trilogy by Timothy Zahn showed firsthand how personal ambition often prevented officers from working together. That's one of the drawbacks to working for a Sith Lord who rewards people who have a lust for power. We even saw this firsthand in Rogue One, with Tarkin stealing credit for Orson Krennic's pet project, the Death Star. We stand here amidst my achievement, not yours! So they're all wearing white uniforms, like this one we first saw Wolf Yularen wearing in A New Hope. And of course, Orson Krennic wore later on. And notice they all have these Imperial code cylinders in their pockets. These are used to access encrypted data like we saw in The Mandalorian. All through this episode, we get a few very important planet names dropped. With the next quarter's detention estimates expected to increase across the Ryloth sector. Ryloth is the home planet of the Twi'lek like Bib Fortune in Return of the Jedi. It was also the setting for an amazing arc of Clone Wars episodes, where the Republic slowly liberates Ryloth from Separatist rule. Afterwards, the Republic became the Empire, and they forced its people into labor camps until the Resistance eventually liberated the people for the people who liberated it before. I mean, no wonder people in this galaxy are so cynical. There is a lot of Arabesh letters in this episode, including on this pad. They're not going to interpret it? No, because like two episodes ago, this stupid show did the Arabesh interpretation for me. And also, it's too blurry for me to read on our little TV. But I was able to read some of the Arabesh that I'll talk about later on. They also mention... Elaborate on these added protection requests for traffic to the Abrian sector. Now, the Abrion sector contains at least three planets that we've seen before. Rishi, side of the Rishi maze that Obi-Wan mentions in Attack of the Clones. According to my information, it should appear in this quadrant here, just south of the Rishi maze. And it was also the site of a battle in the Clone Wars episode Rookies. The sector also contains Planet Kamino, where the clones were created and trained, and we saw, like, all through the Clone Wars. And the other notable planet is Scarif, site of the final battle in Rogue One, where Cassian Andor, spoiler, lost his life. And the reason traffic is increasing to that sector is... And the reason construction equipment is being stepped up is because this sector is where the Empire was working on Stardust. That's the code name for the Death Star. The Death Star was the Empire's most closely guarded secret for decades, with equipment being rerouted and shuttled around so no officer except a Grand Admiral would have any idea what was being built. Back to our heroes where Luthen gives Cassian a kyber crystal. Now these of course are the power source for a Jedi's lightsaber, and eventually they were the power sources for at least one Death Star. The kyber crystals have a connection to the Force. When a Jedi Padawan is able to build their lightsaber, they travel to planet Inlum, where the crystals call out to them. You think it's your crystal? Because kyber crystals have a physical connection to the Force, many of the faithful wear them as totems. Jen Erso's mother gifted her one. We saw a kyber crystal hanging from Marva's console last episode, and Luthen says, It's a Kuati signet. Kuati likely refers to the planet of Kuat, site of a massive shipyard that was a vital planet to the Republic and then to the Empire. And by the way, the crystal being blue here implies that the lightsaber blade will also be blue. And he adds, it Celebrates the uprising against the Rakatan invaders. And that is a deep cut from the Star Wars Legends game Knights of the Old Republic. The Rakata are from the Unknown Regions, you know, where this happened. Somehow Palpatine returned. And they were one of the first races to travel through hyperspace, and they were force wielders who conquered planets using the dark side, like thousands and thousands of years ago. They were brutal, feared, and looked very silly. So this Kyber crystal is a very valuable artifact, and later on we see why he has it. He owns a gallery filled with antiquities. Meanwhile, the Imperials have taken over the security at Morlana, just like they did at Cloud City during the Galactic Civil War. The captain warned Cyril Karn that this would happen if he made too much noise. Minimizing the time the Empire spends thinking about Priox Morlana benefits our superiors and by extension everyone. Now Dedra is looking for the Imperial Star Path unit and using this search to widen her influence. Elsewhere in the world, Cyril Karn arrives at his mom's house and apparently she lives in the lower levels where the poorer people in Coruscant live, like we saw in Attack of the Clones and in the Clone Wars Season 7, Episode 5. Now when he arrives at this terminal, notice that all of the Star Paths for 
before the galaxy are listed, almost like train lines. This is because you can't travel a straight line through the galaxy from point A to point B. You have to travel through subspace on specific hyperspace lanes. So this is noting where there are different hyperspace junctions that tell you the fastest path to transfer between these different paths for alternate routes. When Luthen arrives on Coruscant, this Arabesh reads Coruscant, Core World Course. He hides his robes, wig, and jewelry in a hidden compartment, just like he hides his true self from everyone that he meets in his life. And I love this scene where he practices putting on a dopey face for his clients. Back on Adani, Cass, oh, I mean Clem, is dodging TIE fighter patrols and getting to know the new crew. Vel gave him the TLDR on this region. When the Empire came into this sector, they built organized business districts and forced everyone out of their home villages and made them work on a paying basis that benefited the Emperor's glorious new regime. And we saw the beginning of this in the Bad Batch, when the Empire was forcing everyone to be assigned an Imperial chain code. So all of this is straight from the Colonizer playbook. Destroy a culture's indigenous traditions and then replace those traditions with your own. Vel mentions, a few shepherds in the hills. Nature lovers. Mystics. That's Mabrani. It's a temple or what's left of it. And I'm wondering if she could be referring to old Jedi temples and if those were the mystics that she referred to earlier. Back at their outpost, one of them says, So Guerrera. And you'll remember him. I just talked about him. Forrest Whitaker's character, Rogue One. Back on Coruscant, Mon Mothma arrives at the gallery. Now, this is one of my favorite Star Wars Easter eggs. I mention it all the time. She is played by Genevieve O'Reilly, who played her in Rogue One and voiced the character in Star Wars Rebels. But she first played Mon Mothma in a Revenge of the Sith deleted scene that I love, where she, Padme, and Bail Organa lay the foundations for the Rebellion. No one can be told. She mentions Chandril and Custom. Now, Chandrilli and Custom refers to her home world of Chandrilia, which eventually will become the first capital of the New Republic. Public. There's a few other scattered Easter eggs in this gallery. He gives her an Utapawan monk cudgel, Utapaw being the planet from Revenge of the Sith where Obi-Wan kills Grievous. So uncivilized. Behind him here we see some Mandalorian armor, which does belong in a museum because it's ancestral and centuries old. The armor I wear is 500 years old. The battles, the history, the blood, all lives within it. This object in the background is a Calicori. These are priceless family heirlooms of Twi'lek houses, the residents of Ryloth that I talked about earlier. In Star Wars Rebels, Grand Admiral Thrawn is able to understand Hera Syndulla just by studying her family's Calicori. May I introduce Hera Syndulla? Rebel pilot. I absolutely love this part of the story. I love seeing spy stuff, political intrigue, how Mon Mothma is suspicious of her driver, all of this. We've never seen a great spy story play out in Star Wars. The spies have always been in the background of the larger tale being told. Now, Mon Mothma teases the identity of a new person being drawn into their inner circle. I found someone I think can help me. Now, this could be Bail Organa, but if that deleted scene that I mentioned before is canon, then he's been with the Rebellion before there even was a Rebellion. We cannot let a thousand years of democracy disappear without a fight. Is it Leia? No, I don't think so. See, the book, Leia, Princess of Alderaan, showed us exactly when Leia discovered the Rebellion, and that scene takes place two years after this series. So who is it? Personally, I think it might be Ahsoka Tano. Ahsoka was a key leader in the early Rebellion, connecting several rebel cells under the name Fulcrum. Or, if it's a politician, it might be Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> What? Come on, the guy's a veteran. So in this scene, we learn that Mon Mothma is funding the rebellion. That's what the stolen Imperial payroll is supposed to go toward. And again, I love that we're getting into the nuts and bolts here, really showing how in the hell this ragtag group of teenagers and ruffians could overthrow a galactic Sith empire. Later in her apartment, we see that it's decorated with white and gold, which seems angelic and opulent, but it's also a callback to the formal Jedi robes worn during the High Republic era. She and her husband, who by the way, is totally gonna turn on her and die, are planning a dinner party. Mon Mothma notes that he's invited someone from the vizier's office. So I think she's referring to the emperor's grand vizier, Masa Meda, who was by his side during the Clone Wars, even subliminally telling Jar Jar to nominate Palpatine for emergency powers. If only Senator Amidala were here. Now, Masa Meda would later go on to host the public destruction of Jedi lightsabers after the Clone Wars, and after Palpatine's death, he was the one who surrendered to the Alliance. Now, the Vizier's office is already annoyed by Mon Mothma's actions because she's opposed to the way the Empire is treating the people of Gorman. Now, an event called the Gorman Massacre is eventually what will cause Mon Mothma to sever ties with the Empire and formally join the Rebellion. See, this takes place about three years after this series. The Empire slaughtered peaceful protesters, and the survivors ended up joining Saul Guerrero's partisans. After Afterwards, Mon Mothma blamed Palpatine publicly, and the Empire put out a warrant for her arrest. And then, the rebel cell on Lothal had to get her to safety. We're in the process of building an alliance. My challenge to the Emperor 
was a call to stand against the Empire. Back on Aldolani, Clem is getting to know his fellow heisters as they walk through their plan with a model. Obviously it's not to scale. And by the way, that line had to have been a reference to this. Please excuse the crudity of this model. I didn't have time to build it to scale or to paint it. During the plan, they mention a temple on the river. And this could be that temple of the mystics that we heard about earlier. Maybe the climax of this heist will take place at the ruins of a Jedi temple. And it's even possible that this celestial event could be some sort of Force Awakening event that will aid in the hero's escape. I was able to interpret the tech readouts that they gave him. This reads Rondo Holler and Console Layout, and this says Garrison Aldani and Descent Vector. Now, of course, if this is a high show, then something's gonna go wrong and someone's gonna die. My money is on that nice sleepy kid who feels a lot like Mouse in The Matrix. Also, one of them is gonna be a traitor. If you have any thoughts on who that could be or any other Easter eggs, let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.